Hello and welcome to the second part of chapter five. Uh, what we are going to be covering today is the idea of anti-racism and implicit bias. So you've already completed some of the basic work in chapter five, going over discrimination and prejudice and what these terms mean and where they came from. And so now we're gonna look a little deeper into prejudice and racism. So you may remember way back, like, I don't know, what is it, three weeks ago? <laughs> Maybe it seems like a long time ago, we did the cycle of socialization and we talked about identity privilege. And this is just any unearned benefit or advantage we receive in society by nature of our identity. And we all looked at different ways in which we are privileged and other ways where we are not privileged or we are disadvantaged. Uh, so some examples we looked at were race, religion. A lot of people actually looked at religion, gender identity, sexual orientation, ability, citizenship status. These are all examples of different identities where some of us have an advantage and some of us don't. And we all experience our privilege and lack thereof within the context of our own community and the people we interact with. So it all is sort of relative. It doesn't mean that all privileges are equal. For example, my right-handed privilege of being someone that writes with the right hand is not worth the same as my educational privilege of me having multiple graduate degrees, right? There's different, there's different levels to this, right? The point is though that our identities are complex and they're intersectional, right? There's lots of things that go into each of our identities. And just because we benefit from one does not mean we benefit from all forms. So a lot of common questions come up, and this is by no means an exhaustive list. It's just some of the ones that I hear almost every semester. Um, and these are some of the questions that we tackle in this course. And these are some of the ideas and thoughts that people have while they're taking this course. And we all kind of come to a place where we have to um, critically analyze the idea that the characteristics of white supremacy have become norms and standards in our society. And it's because many of us have been socialized through these characteristics because we were raised in this society. And because these things are normalized, it can be challenging to recognize them at first. And sometimes it feels like an attack an attack on your values, on your worldview, on the, you know, the things you grew up with, the things that you just know. And it may seem that recognizing your privilege kind of invalidates your own personal struggle. Like I had challenges too, um, but what I'm here to tell you is that all of those things are important. That addressing privilege is uncomfortable and you may experience a range of emotions. But what's important to remember is that you don't have to feel guilty. Your, the feeling of guilt doesn't even need to enter the equation. So these are some of the common feelings that individuals have when they start examining this relationship of privilege in their life. It could be defensiveness, like I'm not going to feel guilty for what I inherited. If some people don't have those same privileges, tough luck. It could be guilt. This is just so unfair, but what am I supposed to do about it? I never asked for this. One little person can't change a system that's been around for hundreds of years. It could be displacement, where it's common for people with privilege of all kinds to believe it's actually they who are discriminated against and that the others have the privilege. This is kind of reverse discrimination. And then sometimes it's just flat out denial. Like, I don't believe this study, test, research, experience is accurate. I just don't, I don't buy it, I don't believe it. And these are just all common ways that our ego, um, talking Freudian terms now, um, psychology, but it's just the way the defense mechanisms we have when we're dealing with a level of anxiety that we're just not used to dealing with. But you shouldn't feel guilty. If we inherit injustice, we should never feel guilty. We are not responsible for that past. However, if we choose to do nothing about it going forward, 
then we have plenty to feel guilty about. And that's where we find ourselves in this course. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty for things that happened in the past. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty for feeling normal feelings. What I am asking you is to search yourself, to think about some of these things and how they may be prevalent in your life, and just sit with that for a minute. Think about it and think how you can move beyond it. That's really the goal here. So it's important to note that an implicit stereotype is one that occurs outside of conscious awareness and control. It's not something that you're consciously thinking. And it's normal and okay to have implicit stereotypes. It is, you know, based on the socialization that we've had in this society. This week, we're working on looking at implicit bias, but we're also going to be taking an implicit bias assessment. And the goal of the test is, again, not to make anyone feel guilty. And it doesn't mean that when you take the test that it's your prejudice, right? It's just to raise awareness of the personal unconscious bias you may possess. And again, it's okay to have these biases. Biases of some sort exist in almost every single society. What's not okay is to consciously act on them. That's why we learn about discrimination and racism. So to make this lecture a little more fun, I am going to read through a comic strip. And this link in the slides that you have access to is actually to a video, but I think it moves a little too fast. So I am going to read the comic myself instead of showing the video. This comic is from The Oatmeal. I know you can't see that on your screen right now, but I will show you at the end. And you do have a link to The Oatmeal's website. You're not going to believe what I'm about to tell you. I'm going to tell you some things, and you're not going to believe these things I tell you. And that's okay. You have good reason not to. But I need you to keep listening, regardless of what you believe. I don't care if you're liberal, conservative, or somewhere in between. I don't care if you're a cat person, a dog person, or a tarantula person. Morning owl or night owl, iPhone or Android, Coke or Pepsi. I don't care. All I care about is that you read this to the end. Sound good? Then let's begin. You may have heard that George Washington had wooden teeth. He lost most of his teeth in his 20s and had a set of dentures made out of wood. It's a disturbing visual, the founding father, commander-in-chief, and first president of the United States click-clacking his way through a ham sandwich. Except it isn't true. In 2005, at the National Museum of Dentistry in Baltimore, Laser scans were performed on Washington's 200-year-old dentures and found them to be made of gold, lead, hippopotamus ivory, horse, and donkey teeth. Uh, his mouth was a petting zoo of nightmares. Upon learning this information, I want to ask you something. How did it feel to learn this new fact about George Washington's teeth? I stated a thing, I provided evidence of that thing, and presumably you now believe in the thing I stated. Presumably your belief in the composition of George Washington's teeth has changed with little to no friction. Presumably, the next time you're at a party and George Washington's teeth come up in conversation, you're going to proudly impart this newfound knowledge to your fellow partygoers. Yes? Terrific. Let's continue. 
What if I told you George Washington had another set of false teeth? What if I told you this other set wasn't made from wood, ivory, or any of the aforementioned materials? What if I told you it was made from the teeth of slaves? Now, let's try this again. How did it feel to learn this fact about George Washington? Any more of that friction I mentioned earlier? Before we go any further, allow me to reiterate. I am not here to convince you that George Washington was a bad person. I could go through all my cited sources and cherry pick arguments that either deify or demonize George Washington. I could paint a portrait of a monster or I could exonerate a patriot. But as I said before, I don't care. It's not the point. The point is to give you an emotional barometer of how you feel when presented with new ideas. Because you may have noticed that the first fact about George Washington's teeth was rather easy to accept. I would even wager that when I told you the first fact, you accepted it without question. But when I told you the second fact, you immediately checked my sources and are now furiously composing an informed yet incendiary retort, which you will boldly deliver to me in the form of a sour, blustering Facebook comment. And that's okay. That's all part of it. Let's try a few more. Napoleon Bonaparte was not short. He was 5'7", which was taller than the average Frenchman of the time. Thomas Crapper did not invent the flush toilet, nor did the word crap come about because of his name. Houseflies live for about a month, not 24 hours. Humans don't explode in a vacuum, nor do we boil. We just pass out from lack of oxygen and then we die. Again, as you read these facts, take stock of how you feel. I'm guessing you softened to the last few fairly easily. Let's try a few more and then we're done. There is zero evidence that Jesus Christ was born on December 25th. The Pledge of Allegiance was written by a socialist. Six of the seven justices who voted in favor of Roe v. Wade were Republican appointed. How'd those last three feel? Depending on your beliefs, I'm guessing it may have put some of you about here. At the very least, you can concede that it felt different to hear those statements compared to the ones about Napoleon or house spots. Yes? But why? Why do we easily soften to some ideas but not to others? Why do we gnash our teeth when presented with evidence counter to our beliefs? Why do we not only ignore this evidence but dig our heels in deeper and believe more strongly in the opposing argument? Why would providing more evidence make someone less likely to believe in an idea. It seems backwards and bat bum crazy bonkers to me. It turns out bat bum crazy bonkers has a name in the world of neuroscience. It's called the backfire effect and it's a well-documented psychological behavior. A few years ago at the University of Southern California's Brain and Creativity Institute, a study was conducted where participants were placed into a MRI machine. Once inside, they were presented with counter arguments to strongly held political beliefs. A few examples. Laws restricting gun ownership should be made more restrictive. Gay marriage should not be legalized. As pa participants were read these counter arguments, various parts of their brains were scanned for activity. What the study revealed 
was that the part of the brain that responds to a physical threat also responds to an intellectual one. This area of the brain is known as the amygdala, and it's the emotional core of your mind. Unfortunately, it makes us biologically wired to react to threatening information the same way we'd react to being attacked by a predator. From an evolutionary standpoint, it makes sense. If you were a caveman and another caveman threw a boulder at your head, you wouldn't react by logically debating the pros and cons of getting brained. Core beliefs are the beliefs which people cherish the most deeply. They usually develop from childhood and are compounded by life experiences. Core beliefs are inflexible, rigid, and incredibly sensitive to being challenged. When I told you that George Washington's dentures were made from animal bones, it probably didn't ruffle many feathers. But when I suggested they were made from slave teeth, I'm guessing it caused strife with some of you. There are obvious cultural reasons for this. Slavery is a sensitive, hot-button issue. But there are biological reasons as well. The amygdala of your brain is screaming, Battle stations! Some of you may have held a world view that George Washington was a patriot and a hero. By presenting negative information about him, it challenged that world view. Your brain loves consistency. It builds a world view like we build a house. It has a foundation and a frame and windows and doors, and it knows exactly how everything fits together. If a new piece is introduced and it doesn't fit, the whole house falls apart. Your brain protects you by rejecting that piece. It then builds a fence and a moat and refuses to let in any visitors. This is why we have the backfire effect. It's a biological way of protecting a worldview. Just remember that your worldview isn't a perfect house that was built to last forever. It's a cheap condo and over time, most of it will fall apart. So, what do we do about this? Some of you have probably been nodding along in agreement, waiting for me to deliver a series of clever, combative ways to offset the backfire effect. The disappointing truth is that I don't have much advice for you. I don't have a way to change the behavior of 7.5 billion people carrying their beliefs around like precious gems wrapped in hand grenades. Sure, there are ways of changing people's minds that are more effective than others, but ultimately they all fall short. This is compounded by the internet, where anything can be cited as a source and every disagreement degrades into a room full of orangutans throwing feces at one another. The best I can do is make you aware of it so you can identify the backfire effect in your own brain, which isn't easy. The mind can separate, can't separate the emotional cortex from the logical one. And one could argue that this emotional underbelly is what makes us human. But I would argue that it also is what makes us animals. I sometimes pretend the amygdala of my brain is in, in my pinky toe. When a core belief is challenged, I imagine it yelling insane things at me. I let it yell. I let it have its moment. I let the emotional cortex fight its little fight. And then I listen. And then I change. Because this universe of ours is so achingly beautiful and we're all in it together. We're all going in the same direction. I'm not here to take control of the wheel or to tell you what to believe. I'm just here to tell you that it's okay to stop, to listen, to change.
So what is implicit bias? Implicit bias describes the way that stereotypes and attitudes we are not aware of shape our behavior. And this is informed by our socialization. The messages we receive from friends, colleagues, institutions, media, etc. These all influence our socialization. And of course, this has been going on for years. Um, and so there's some examples I just want to point out just to help you understand it. Um, one of them can be the idea that standard English is privileged as linguistic capital in academia. Like you have to know standard English. And if you know it and you grew up with it and you learned it in school, then you have a privilege, an unearned privilege for native English speakers. Students of color often experience stereotype threat, which we learned about last week, perpetuated by socially ingrained beliefs of white superiority. And this leads to students of color performing worse on standardized testing. It's a lot of research in this area, not just in with race with stereotype threat, but lots of other uh, identities also. To reframe our thinking, that's thinking that's been ingrained in us, been socialized in us, we need to acknowledge and explore how racism and implicit bias show up in different contexts. Just exploring it. And one way we're going to do that is through the implicit association test, otherwise called the IAT. Now there's two um, researchers that came up with this test. And really their question was, how can we measure when what is in our mind is out of line with our own attentions? Because remember, implicit means unconscious. Like we're not consciously saying that we have a certain bias. Like I know I have a bias. Like it is not in our conscious mind. But how do you measure something like that? Right? And this has really been the dilemma of this area of brain research for many, many years. And so a tool was developed by Anthony Greenwald from um, the University of Washington and Mazarin Banaji from Harvard to study prejudice in social context. So I have a link to their interview. This interview is here from 2008. Um, and I did take some material from the interview to put in this presentation, but if you're interested to listen to them speak about it, there is a link to that interview. But the purpose of the test is to measure attitudes and beliefs that people may be unwilling or unable to report. It measures strength of associations between concepts and evaluations or stereotypes. The test is simply to develop personal awareness of implicit preferences and stereotypes. So this test has been implemented in a study called Project Implicit. It's hosted at Harvard. It's been ongoing for, I think it's over 10 years now, but it's been taken over 28 million times. They have a whole like business to this. They go around, they do different presentations and there's been papers written and I think I have some of those, but mostly students wanna know, well, how does it work? Because it's a little different and sometimes remember back to our core sort of responses, we may think, oh, this isn't accurate, this doesn't work. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what it does and how it works, and you can always research more about how it works, and there's like over 150 articles you can read about it, but how it works is that when we encounter two things that have not been paired together very much in our experience, it takes a little longer to put them together in your brain because they're strangers to each other. So it makes the task a little difficult. This test measures that little amount of time. And really it's looking at reaction time. It's looking at reaction time at a level so minuscule that you may hardly recognize it. Um, but when you're doing the test, you think, oh, this is hard, it's, it's a trick, it's tricking my, my fingers, right? But really this is about what's happening in your brain because your brain likes patterns. It likes to put things together. And when you have things or are asked to put two things together that you don't, don't normally do, it just takes a little more effort from your brain. Now your results do not mean your prejudice. Prejudice is a state of mind that leads to intentional discriminatory behavior. That is not what this test is doing. It is just a window 
into otherwise difficult to detect contents of our minds. And we all have these. Um, in some cases, we find things we did not know were there. It may be an inconvenient truth that what's there is not what we thought was there or that we want it to be there. Um, so we do have some ways at the end uh, to get rid of it, right? So is it valid? Is it valid always comes up, and there have been some critics uh, for this test. And this research, the critical research, is significantly older. And about 2 to 3 percent of um, the claims were critical enough to lead to change in the test. And this was what was reported in 2008. So these changes were made, you know, almost 20 years ago. Some of the criticism was useful in guiding research, some of it was just not valid. In other cases, the criticism was used to lead to improvements in the test design. So the body of work on implicit bias as a concept outside of this test shows that there is a significant problem. And the theory has been um, utilized in so many different areas of our society. Uh, there have been over 3,100 research studies launched about using um, or about the IIT or using it, 150 peer-reviewed papers published, 500 education sessions have been facilitated. So this is not just some crazy, wacky Facebook survey Professor O found online, right? This is a valid psychological test. Okay, so when you take it, you're going to get some results, and you have some instructions on the assignment page for the tests that you're going to take. One of them will be one that we, we will all do, and the other one is your choice. Um, I'm not going to have you publicly um, like publicize your scores. Right? So on our discussion board, you are not going to have to um, discuss what your scores were. Uh, so don't feel that you are pressured in any way to let anyone know what your scores were. Um, you will write and reflect about your scores in a personal journal um, just to me. So it's very possible you're going to have an implicit, implicit preference that you entirely do not want. So there are some solutions to reverse or undo the patterns that created this unwanted preference. And so you have a few here, I'm trying to keep this video under 30 minutes and we're almost there. Um, so you have some examples here of ways that you can undo these patterns. Um, and research shows that implicit preferences are actually quite malleable. So it is possible to manage and change them if you want to. Now, Taking a test on the website may not be perfectly accurate, but that said, it is very possible to have an implicit preference that you do not want. Now, as we move forward after this module, we're going to start learning about events in the lived experience of each of our racial ethnic groups, um, all the ones we study, that may make you uncomfortable and even angry, and that's okay. These feelings are necessary for any social change to occur. And ultimately, that's what we are always looking towards in this book, to make things better um, in our book, in our course, in our lives. So each module will also, in addition to the events that may be uncomfortable to watch or read about, will also have stories of how people persevered and how they rose up and challenged institutionalized racism. So please, as you move forward, remember that you will encounter feelings and emotions about material that may be uncomfortable, and it's okay. All I ask is that you sit with that, think about it, consider why you feel that way, and perhaps change a little bit. Thank you so much.